Well, good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad that you're here, whether that means you're in person or online. We're excited and thankful that you're a part of our extended family here at Sea Road as we're diving into week two of this series we started last week called The Art of Hope. Dramatic effect. <laughs> the Art of Hope as we walk through the book of Philippians. It's going to be awesome. And we talk about the art of hope because hope is more art than it is science. It's not logical at times. We can't predict when we're going to need it or we can't follow a pattern and, and just go through the process and then we're going we're gonna to create hope along the way. Sometimes, sometimes we have to shift and move and react differently based on the set of circumstances or the situation that we find ourselves in. Last week, Pastor Desiree marched us through the, the launch of this series and we learned from first this first chapter in Philippians that God is faithful to complete the work that he started. Amen? Amen. God is faithful to complete the work that he started. Philippians 1 6. If you are looking for a, a chunk of scripture to memorize. That's an excellent one to memorize because when you're in the thick of it, when you're in the middle of the uncertainty and the unknown, it's good to claim the faithfulness of God and say he's faithful to complete the work that he started. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to instantaneously receive the complete work that he started. Some of the work that we inherit and we benefit from takes time, it takes time to simmer, to get savory and all kinds of good, and then it becomes Ours in, si in season and in time according to God's goodness and faithfulness. We're going to dive right into, again, Philippians chapter 1. If you've got a Bible with you, I want to invite you to turn with me. We're going to focus on the last few verses of this chapter, verses 27 through 30. If you've got a mobile device, I highly encourage you, if you haven't done so already, download the YouVersion Bible app and you can follow along every Sea Road Sunday, whether you are in person or on your boat in the St. Lawrence or Charleston Lake or wherever you might be, and you can follow along with us in rhythm and in sequence for our time together. Let's read this and learn from the word with one another. Chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by our, your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved, even by God himself. For you have been given not only the, the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. Those four verses are going to encapsulate our conversation today. We're going to walk through four pieces from this text that I think are super valuable for us to understand where we might be in this season and in this moment of time, individually, but also collectively as a community. Verse 27, Paul writes to his, his friends, and, and remember that this, this group of people was really special to Paul. It was like his first community, his Jesus-centered community or church that he helped to launch and initiate. And because of that, he has an affinity and an affection towards them. Now, that doesn't mean if you have more than one child that your oldest child is your favorite, okay? In the Frizzell household, I guarantee you, every single child signs any card that they give to mom and dad, your favorite child. They all believe that they are favorite, and they aren't. Just kidding. I love them all. They are favorites. We love them. And so Paul's got this affinity and this connection with this community. He reminds them of his expectations, his encouragement to live as citizens of heaven. That's the first point that we're going to cover briefly. What does a citizen of heaven look like? What does it mean to live into that citizenship? You and I, if we happen to be born in Canada, we inherit Canadian citizenship. 
And because of that Canadian citizenship, there are some responsibilities. Now, we can also earn that citizenship through a variety of means. We can go through the, the immigration process and become a citizen of a, of a country that we weren't born into. We can, by proxy, find our way forward if we marry into citizenship. There's a different ways that you can graft citizenship. Heavenly citizenship, however, is achieved by only one thing. Believing in Jesus and following him with your life. That's how you gain heavenly citizenship. That's the access. And citizenship is a wonderful thing. It made me think all about traveling and citizenship and passports. And I was reminded of this story of one of the passports that I had in previous days. You're going to see a photo of this on screen. Just so you know, I'm not telling a lie or a misnomer. Right there. Look at that handsome guy. Woo! Come on. Now, there's a group of young adults and young married people in our church that are like, Jason, bring back the main. That's not going to happen, okay? I barely got permission to show you this photo. Now, there's an interesting story about this passport that I want to share with you. Now, this passport gave me access to travel. But on the day before I was supposed to step on a plane to Brazil, I realized I didn't have my passport yet. And I was thinking, huh, this is going to be hard to go through immigration without a passport. And it just so happened that my good friend, who was soon to be my girlfriend, she just didn't know it, Bonnie, was also missing her passport. And so we had to play hooky from work, and we had a date, and she didn't even know it was a date, but I knew it was a date. <laughs> and we had to spend six hours at the passport office begging them, begging them to fast forward our application so that we could get on this plane and we weren't going on vacation with one another. We were going on a missions trip. We were going on a missions trip to serve people, to care for orphans and those who had been lost and abandoned and abused and mistreated. And so when I look at this photo, I think of a whole lot of things. I think of like I had no idea what was going to happen when I stepped on that plane. I also think of, man, God is miraculous because if a dude like that can ask the love of his life to marry him, then man, there is a God. <laughs> so no, the main is not coming back. <laughs> Citizens of heaven. Without that passport, I would not have been able to get on that plane. I would have not been able to cross country lines. I would have not been able to partner with what Jesus wanted to do in my own life. He spoke some deep and meaningful things into my life. I wouldn't have had access to any of that if I didn't have my passport, and if I didn't have my citizenship, I couldn't have had my passport. And sometimes, if we're honest, we take being a citizen of heaven for granted. We live for tomorrow, and that's great. We're like, man, we're secure. We know Jesus. We know where we're going to go when, we're, when we pass away here in our human existence, and that's enough for me. But I'm telling you, there's expect expectations and responsibilities that you and I are supposed to live into here and now. See, being a citizen of a heaven is not just about eternity. It's about today. There's an expectation that you and I are going to live and embody the, the values of heaven right here, right now. Here's, here's some of the values of heaven. Love above all things. Humility instead of pride. Generosity. Those things need to be deeply woven into our fabric and DNA of our lives. And if they are not, then you and I, we are not acting like citizens of heaven. And all you got to do is pick up any sort of news-related media to the absence of a kingdom value to understand that there are too many of us who claim to follow Jesus and aren't demonstrating that by the way we choose to live. Being a citizen of heaven comes with an expectation and a responsibility, not just an inheritance. The inheritance is valuable. It's eternally worthwhile. But let, let us, let you and I live from that perspective even today. Because when we do, we understand that every single person in our world has value. 
doesn't matter how young or how old they are, how able-bodied or infirm they are, how sick or twisted they might be. Everybody has value. And a citizen of heaven is somebody that recognizes that, moves towards it, and to the best of their ability, loves people. If we would replay the story of your life over the last 24 hours or seven days or seven months or seven years, would we see remnants of what it means to be a citizen of heaven? Or would we see somebody who is bitter, frustrated, full of complaints and creating chaos wherever they go? There's an expectation in being a citizen of heaven. I remember when I got that passport, I was so excited, and I would get on the plane, and then, and then it hit me. I'm like, man, as I'm walking through immigration, like, even though I've got this Canadian passport, like, there's some expectations. Like, like if I step out of line, that dude with the M16 could take me down, no problem. If I'm belligerent to the person that's serving me, I'm not demonstrating the values of being a citizen. There's that expectation worldwide that Canadians are what? Polite. They apologize for everything. They apologize for apologizing. It only takes a handful of us to live counter to that reality to change that narrative. The citizens of heaven we're invited to li literally embody the values and presence of Jesus in a moment-by-moment -moment daily basis. And it gets hardest when we feel the heat. I'm not talking about summer. I'm talking about when we ourselves are stressed, when we ourselves are experiencing conflict that we didn't create. Like, has anybody ever talked about you and said things about you that weren't true? Just put your hand up if that's true. Come on, all of you, I'm sure. If not, see me after, I'll help you with that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I would never do that. And it's in those seasons and in those moments and in those situations that your character is gonna speak. And if your character is not rooted in your citizenship, then all sorts of chaos can bubble up. That doesn't mean that we dismiss what's happening in us or through us or around us, but what that means is that we see it through kingdom eyes and a kingdom perspective. What that means is we cannot hold people to account to kingdom mindset if they do not yet know Jesus. That's what that means. Paul writes to this group of Philippians and he says, man, if, if there's anything else that you could just do, if, if I can't visit you, I just want to know that you will be known as a citizen of heaven. My hope and my prayer is that you and I would be known as citizens of heaven. It starts with believing. Believing Jesus to be the risen son of God. Trusting him with your very life and doing your best to follow him. And yes, you are going to make mistakes. I have probably several million that I could think of. But even in those mistakes, I attempt to fail forward, pursue forgiveness, ask for forgiveness, and apologize where necessary, not just because I'm Canadian. There's a second thing from this text that's super important for us to understand, and it kind of flows out of our, our resonance and connection with our citizenship, being a citizenship citizen of heaven. And that is this. In verse 28, we're reminded, Paul says, don't be intimidated. Don't be intimidated. Now, what does that mean and what does that look like? We live in a culture that is built on fear. We live in a culture that is built on fear. 
We need, we need to fear that we're not going to get the, the appropriate test score for the exam that we studied for. We need to fear that we're not going to find any sort of meaningful romantic connection in our lifetime. We've got to fear that we're not going to be able to find friends when we parachute into a new environment. And I know some of our graduating grade 12 students are in that space right now. They're going to leave Brockville maybe for the first time, and they're going to go to a post-secondary experience, and they're going to be like, am I, am I cool enough? Like, I'm from small city. Brockville. I was a big fish in Brockville. Now I'm, now I'm like a, a minnow in a vast ocean and there's huge whale sharks and stuff. Like I'm gonna, am I going to fit in? Am I going to meet people? There's fear that, that we go to work and they're going to cut our wage. There's fear that the inflation rate is going to stay. Like who, who enjoys paying $2 for gas per liter? Not this guy. If you do, God bless you. You can come fill up my minivan later. Like 400 bucks, it's an exaggeration, but it feels like it. And Paul reminds this group of people not to be intimidated, and there are too many times where we've been intimidated. Now, here's the thing about intimidation. We don't meet intimidation with belligerence and arrogance. We meet intimidation or intimidation, intimidation, intimidating circumstances with just courage. And courage in those environments looks like this. The willingness to stand up and listen and be slow to speak. I got one of my kids that's been experiencing a lot of bullying at school. Maybe you've experienced bullying. I know I experienced bullying at school. And it's hard every day when you got to walk through the story with them and their experiences and and understand what they are walking through on a day-to-day basis. We talk about intimidation. We talk about what it means to walk in those environments and those spaces with your head held high. Some of us, if we're honest, we have a hard time connecting with any sort of church-type community because we fear judgment. We fear that somebody knows what we've been up to that isn't Jesus-like, and then they're going to uncover it, and then boom, we're going to get blasted for it. Or some of us fear even connecting with Christians because all we've ever received from them is criticism. In those environments and situations that are extremely intimidating, what we are invited to do is embrace that intimidation with just a little bit of courage. I'm not talking about protesting. I'm talking about facing those challenging circumstances with courage. Being present in those spaces. So with one of my kids and his bullying, we taught him some techniques on how to stand up for himself. How to be present. How not to run from. How to make your voice matter and count. And if we're honest, there's a whole whole spectrum of challenging, intimidating circumstances that you and I will face. We've got some unrealistic fears just even on our pastoral staff team. I'm afraid of sharks. Never seen a shark in person. Never swam with a shark. I know there's no sharks in the St. Lawrence, but every time I go in that water, I'm like, is this the day? (laughs) Right? And then somebody starts singing that baby shark song. That's an intimidating (laughs) song, right? Forget the Jaws theme. It's that baby shark. Is that no baby shark? They go chomp, chomp. Like, that's not good. Pastor Jamie has this unrealistic fear of snakes. Like, so much so, you can leave a coiled piece of rope in his office, and then he won't go in there. (laughs) He's afraid of the snake. Daniel, Daniel's afraid of losing golf to me. <laughs> now, he never will because I don't play, but he's, he fears it. It's an unrealistic fear. They exist in us. These fears, these moments, these concerns. And we can laugh about some of them, but some of them, some of them are quite painful. There's a phobia for everything. But in the midst of that phobia, there's a cure for that paralysis. Because that's what fear does. It paralyzes us. It intimidates us so we don't move. 
When God speaks to us, we're like, oh my goodness, I, I would, but then everybody will see what I'm doing. Then my friends will think I'm crazy. I moved across the country in a global pandemic. Yes, I am insane. Sometimes these intimidating situations that you're faced with, we're supposed to meet them standing on our citizenship, our followership of Jesus with a little bit of a courage and not let fear win the day. There's a third thing that Paul writes about in verse 29. He talks about a theology of suffering or an understanding of suffering. And the truth is, too many, too many Christian communities talk about only the health and well-being and prosperity that you're going to receive when you follow Jesus. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes the blessings are easy, easy to receive, but other times they're really challenging to swallow. It is a blessing that we can walk through suffering and don't have to do it alone. It's a blessing, okay? Some of you all know the story that we've walked through this last year as a family with health-related tragic events in our extended family. It is a blessing to walk through those with a group of people that love Jesus, but also with the very presence of the, of the being that created our world and our universe. Because as much as we shared with some of you, man, there was a whole lot more we held back. And it's only because of having the presence of Jesus walking with us through those dark spaces that we can still stand in the midst of suffering. The truth is, it's not going to be all roses and rainbows and skittles when you follow Jesus. It's not. I'd love to tell you something different, but I'd be lying to you. But what I will say to you is what Jesus says to us and what the word of God reminds us of is that Jesus can create beauty out of even the most broken of moments and memories. He can bring dead things to life and turn ashes into something that bears fruit. Just read Ezekiel 37, value of dry bones. Try to figure that out intellectually in your brain, how that happened without the power of God creating a new way forward. We're going to suffer. And when we suffer, we need to remember that we don't suffer alone. Now, suffering here in Canada can look a whole lot different than it looks in like developing world. Like many of us in this room and in this space and even online don't have to think about where we're gonna get our next meal from. Maybe not all of us, but many of us. In fact, we might think through options. Ooh, what's in my fridge? Or what's in my wallet? Where are we gonna order from? That's a luxury. Much of our world doesn't have that same opportunity as we do. So suffering could look different. Suffering could look like believing a lie that we're the only one to experience what we're going through right now. Suffering could look like facing a medical diagnosis head on with your head held high, knowing that you don't know how it's going to turn out as you walk through a pursuit towards health. Suffering could mean being a Leafs fan. but it's better than being a Sens fan. So, okay, there we go. We all know suffering in our team of choice. Senators, Leafs, Montreal Canadiens. We know suffering. That pales in comparison to the suffering that, that we endure in our world. Just yesterday, there was an individual who thought it would be super awesome in Buffalo, New York, to drive to a grocery store and kill 10 people. What do you do with that? We got a, a war in Ukraine that makes absolutely no sense. We've got a homeless challenge right here in our city. These are the things that we are suffering through. 
These are the things. And Paul reminds us that we're supposed to meet these sufferings with the presence of Jesus. Standing on our citizenship, not being intimidated. That doesn't mean we push past the pain or we neglect the hurt or the burdens. That means we embrace them. And we give them to the one that can actually do something about them. As a young kid, when we didn't have cable, the only show that was on TV was the Red Green Show. And I loved when he talked about fixing things, and he said, oh, if you don't have the right parts, just grab duct tape. And you duct tape everything. And if we're honest, sometimes that's the way we approach our own lives. We're too proud. We think we can figure it out on our own. And so we start duct taping our souls, but we're leaking all over the place. And we try and fool the people around us. When they ask us, hey, how are you doing? You're like, oh, I'm good. No, you're not. What if instead we gave ourselves the freedom and permission to walk through our suffering with dignity, honoring one another's movement forward by recognizing it, by hearing one another, and by taking the burden and concern to Jesus who can actually do something about it. This theology of suffering, this learning of suffering, it's a part of our adventure and our journey and we could go on and on and on about the depth of it. But for today, may we be reminded that we are not alone there is a way forward, and there's a promise of restoration, whether that happens here or in eternity. The fourth thing from this text that I think is really important for us to understand is, is kind of illustrated in verse 30, and basically Paul says this, you are not alone because we're in this together. We're in this together. Now, here's the, the challenging thing as we walk through this last season of life that we've been in for, for almost too long in some of our minds. Community and connection has been exceedingly difficult to pursue. I'm going to say this to you as gently and politely as I can. If you do not prioritize connecting with, with, a, with a Jesus-centered community and call yourself a Christian, I would challenge you to say, you may not be following Jesus. See, the thing is, you can't follow Jesus and not embrace this family. I don't mean that I'm expecting everybody to have perfect attendance on a Sunday morning. I'm saying your Jesus-focused community, if that's a group of people that you meet with regularly outside of a church service, amen. But if you're not connecting with anybody that loves Jesus in that environment or in a church community environment, and you say that you're following Christ, I'm going to challenge you and say, I'm not so certain that you are on the road that you think you are. You can't love Jesus and exclude his family. That's the exact same thing I said to Bonnie when, 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 when I asked her to marry me. I was like, you can't love me and exclude my family. You get all the chaos with you. And she said very same thing. I was like, no, I'm the one talking right now. You marry into the family, you get all this richness and all this challenge. And here's the thing, you know, I used to always say this to my sister. I remember this one, one day that she came home from school and somebody had bullied her and I was sick that day and I'd spent the day on the couch, but because she was bullied and I was feeling unwell, I got up, I put on my snowsuit and I, got, I went outside and I had me a little bit of a tussle with this individual that had made fun of my sister. And she was like, Jason, why'd you do that? I was like, because you're my sister. I can make fun of you all the time. But if somebody else does, that's when the gloves come off. Hockey fight style. And that's the reality. Far too many of us are critical of the family of God. I've been there, I've done it. I've said some things. 
I've done some things, and I've forgotten that we're all in it together. So whether or not we fully agree on everything pertaining to what it means to follow Jesus or not, as a citizen of heaven, as somebody that is supposed to stand into and, and embrace intimidating situations with a little bit of courage, face it with those, those moments with a head, head held high, knowing that it might cause some suffering along the way, I have to love the family of God as well. As challenging and complex and frustrating as it can be at times. Again, I'm not talking about church attendance. I'm talking about connecting with a group of people who love Jesus and they spur you on to loving Jesus. Whatever expression that can look like is amazing. We just so happen to be gathered in one expression here today. An expression that's been familiar for a couple thousand years because lots of different groups of community and faith groups do this consistently and have for a long time. But this is one expression. And it's a challenging one because it's like a one-way dialogue. You can give me some feedback, but sometimes it's not personal. So for those of you here who who like live for your Sunday or live for this space or live for that moment where Jason or Daniel or Desiree or Jamie or whomever else preaches from the Sea Road stage and that's what sustains you. It's not us that sustains you. It's the power and presence of Jesus alive in you. That's what sustains you. And so if this is your only expression of community, as gently and as kindly as I can say it, you've got to strive and search for more. You've got to strive and search for more. A community and environment like this should be a catalyst for you to pursue community at a more intimate level with a cluster of people who know your story, your struggle, your name, your challenges, who can encourage you and support you and pray with you and for you. And together, you can spur one another on to love and good deeds. So whether there's an absence of connection or a pseudo affiliation and connection, I think all of us need to be reminded that we're in this together. We're in this together. As challenging and complex as together means, we are in this together. Now that's a lot to digest from four little verses, but I'm gonna tell you, there's a lot more as we soak in this book a little bit longer. So here today, what we wanna do is we wanna give an opportunity and an outlet to express this in this together reality. Each one of us has been wounded in some way. Not just historically, but presently. A challenge that we're facing, a mind shift that we just don't want to make, a burden, a pain, an abuse we carry. And so what we want to do here today is we want to pray specifically for those things. So if you've got a wound at an emotional level, a spiritual level, intellectual level, physical level, we want to pray for healing. And that's how we're going to close our time together here today, by praying for healing in this together. So there's going to be a couple of environments here in this space, an online audience. We are not forgetting about you because you have an opportunity to participate as well. For you onliners, you've got your chat that you can start writing your prayer requests in right now. Or if you would prefer to send more of a private message, you can email myself, Jason, at CentennialRoad.com or Jamie at CentennialRoad.com. And between the two of us, we will make sure that your request gets prayed for and prayed with. And if it means rallying a group of people around you to pray alongside of you, we will do that. Here in this space, what it means is you're going to have three different environments that you can gravitate towards. Right up here at the front is going to be myself and one of our board members, Hanny. 
who is playing on the worship team this morning. And we're going to be right here at the front, and we're going to be willing to pray with anyone who wants to be prayed for, specifically in their woundedness for healing. And if you're going like the front is too intimidating, Jason, right behind the sound booth in the back, we're going to have another cluster. We're going to have Daniel and another one of our board members, Krista, and they will be there willing to pray with you in that space. And for those of you in the balcony that are like, I don't want to walk all the way down. Guess what? Jamie and Desiree are up in that space, ready and willing to pray with you and for you. You might be saying, well, Jason, I'm good. My wounds are, my wounds are tended and cared for. My question to you is this. Are they cared for and connected with the balm of the Holy Spirit, the, 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 the wrapping, the care, and the nurture, or just a piece of duct tape? that you read in a meme online. So whatever your burden, your wound, your pain is here today, we wanna to pray with you and for you so that you can walk through that challenging situation as a citizen of heaven with your head held high in the face of intimidation, even when you're suffering because we are in this together. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to invite you to move as I com conclude my prayer. Or if you're like, man, i got to get in line, then go ahead and do that right now. Father, as we spend these next few moments steeped in your presence, would you, would you unleash healing and, and restoration? I think of fractured relationships. I think of unknowns. I think of fears. I think of deep harbored wounds that we've carried for too long. I think of eyes that don't work well. I think of <clears throat> the treatment plan that's being harder than, than, than we thought. I think of the mental health patterns that need to be restored and renewed. Jesus, we're trusting you because this is the kingdom. Coming to you, laying everything that we have at your feet and asking you to mend, heal, and restore. So would you meet us in this space, in these moments? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May you come forward or backward for prayer or reach out online as we pray.